he, Moshe Rabbeinu goes down this road and he sees something very unusual. He, look, he sees this bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed. And as the Sephardah says, there is an absolute miraculous phenomenon going on here. So Moshe Rabbeinu is seeing this bush on the side of the road, does, does not fully understand, it, cannot fully comprehend what exactly is going on, but he does know that if I move to that particular area and I check that out, my life is not going to be the same. Because as the Sephora points out, that was a prophecy. There was a, re- a revelation going on with that bush. That if I, pr- if I proceed to sort of open that door and explore what's behind that door, my life will not be the same. It will, it will be altered. I don't know exactly how. I don't know exactly in which way, but God has given me an opportunity to sort of challenge myself, to change the course of my life in a much more deeper spiritual direction. Do I want that? Am I ready for it? I've asked, you know, uh, over the years, we used to have a base medrash, not anymore, but we used to have a base medrash here in, uh, as part of Valley Torah. And I used to have those guys, these guys coming to my house uh, once or twice a week for different, you know, shmuzim, whatever, vadim, we used to get together. They used to, uh, had a lot of food. They, they cleaned out our kitchen. It was great. Uh, all the leftovers were gone. 20 guys showed up. Boom, everything is, is finished. But we used to have some great discussions. And, and once a year, I would bring up this point, and I would ask them, if you had a pill, and you knew if you took that pill, it would turn you into Reb Chaim Ozer, or the Chavetz Chaim. Or if you had that pill, and you could become the person who would want to be, I don't know if you ever read Rabbi Tzinkanievsky's book, but if you didn't, you should put it on your agenda. It's an amazing book. And if you had this pill, and that pill would give you the, the inner fortitude, clarity, direction, inspiration to be Rebbe Tsinkanievsky, this amazing woman who changed the lives of thousands of people, which, but she lived an incredible life and a very different life than the typical California life. You couldn't get this person to, 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 to buy something new. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying you know, we're, we're bad, chas v'shom. We like new things and we like, you know, we're, we're part of the regular world. She was in a little bit of a different place, in a different space. But the point is, that everybody, not everybody would take that pill. Right away, some guys would say, oh yeah, sure, if I can be, be the Chavetz Chaim, I would take that pill in a second. And then right away, oh, oh, oh you're, really, you're saying that because that's the, sort of the, the expected answer, but whoa, oh, slow down. Are you really ready? Can you really handle that? Are you, really, are you comfortable never watching a sporting event for the rest of your life? Because you're not going to want to. If you're the Chavetz Chaim, you're not going to want to watch a sporting event. If you're the Chavetz Chaim, you're going to want to be immersed in Torah and Chesed and Mitzvahs all day, and it's great, we need the Chavetz Chaim, and he was one of the greatest men in the last 200 years of our history. But are you ready to just you know, snap your fingers? It's not so simple. And Moshe Beno had a similar type of challenge. He didn't know exactly how, but he did know that walking, taking a right turn and going down that road is going to change the direction of his life. And, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu is watching. And Akash Baruch Hu, the Pasuk, if you read the Pasuk, it's very, very clear. The Pasuk says, Vayar Hashem Kisar Liros. Hashem saw that Moshe turned and he walked a couple of steps and he was ready to say, you know what, I'm doing this. If I have an opportunity to move myself to the next level, I'm not going to miss that opportunity. I'm going to grab it. I'm going to be aware of it and, and, and jump at, at that potential that is latent within that experience. Hashem saw that and he says, you're my man. For Yom Hashem, Moshe, Moshe, Yom Hinein, he called out to Moshe Benu, and he said, I've got a mission for you. And it's very clear, when you look at the Midrashim, it's very, very clear, Moshe Benu was not yet determined to be the agent for HaKadosh Baruch until he made that turn, until he was ready to take those steps and challenge himself by exploring what that burning bush that did not get consumed was all about. And when you're ready to sort of Take that challenge and push yourself to that next level and explore that opportunity. Then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, yes, that's somebody special. And if not, I remember hearing these words way back in Yeshiva in 1973 when I went to uh, Beis Medrash. I went to the Chavetz Chaim Yeshiva right after high school. I went to Eretz Yisrael. I remember I had an incredible Rebbe Rabbi Moshe Tzayt. Chait Zatzal, who would give very, very moving shmuzim. I remember him talking about Moshe Benu, and he, sa- he said those words. Could you imagine Moshe Benu? Had he not made that turn, had it not been Vayar Hashem Kisar Lurz, that he turned to see what is with that bush, what is Akash Baruch Hu trying to tell me? What is he trying to communicate to me? Moshe Benu, if he had, had he gone right down that road, had he said what maybe a lot of people say, 
you know what? I, I got my Blackberry's full. I got a lot of meetings. God, I, I know you're trying to tell me, but really, another time maybe. And not, right now, I just, I'm a little too busy. So I'll come back with you. If you're around next week, Bush, I might come back. But right now, I just got things to do, you know, because I really got a busy schedule. Moshe Beta would have walked straight into oblivion. He would have walked right down that road, never to be heard from again, never to be discussed, never to be put out there as the greatest Jewish leader, because he was just too busy. He had no time. He, he wasn't ready to, to take that challenge. And I think the message for us, I mean, we don't have burning bushes on the side of the road, but we do have moments. We do have situations where we can sort of sense, is this something that I'm ready to do? And maybe when that inspiration's right, and maybe when that opportunity presents itself, to grab it, to not be afraid of that change, and not to be afraid of that challenge in front of us, not to sort of be blind to what is right there because HaKash Baruch Hu might be, and again, it could be at 17, it could be at 22, it could be at 28 or 55, or it could be at all of those times. It could be HaKash Baruch Hu does this to us on a regular basis throughout our lives. And our job is to be ready for that challenge, to be, to be, to be sensitive to that opportunity. Because when we grab them, we define who we are as, as Jews. And if we overlook them, God forbid it could be devastating. I'll just give you one story, a story I think I said last year, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a spooky story. But I, just, I, I, but I think it's really important, certainly for the girls who are here for the first year, this is the first year, you haven't heard it. And it's, a, it's, it's worthwhile repeating anyway, even if you, heard, if you remember it. It's a story that I read in one of Pesach Krohn's books, way, one of the old ones, way back. It's a story about a shochet, about a, slaughter, a person who was a great, wonderful Talmud Chacham, but a person who slaughtered meat in Europe in the early 1900s. He, he would uh, shaft animals and give you know, people kosher, kosher food, kosher meat. And this fellow, he will call him Yankel, for lack of you know, knowing his real name, will call him Yankel the shochet. And Yankel wakes up one night in the middle of the night in a cold sweat with a with a dream that shook him to, its, to his core. And he tells his wife, oh my gosh, I, 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 I'm so frightened, I'm so scared, I had this horrible dream. He said, well, what is it? I have to tell the Rebbe, I, 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 I have to tell the Rebbe, I have to go to the Rebbe. Okay, so go to the Rebbe. So first thing in the, in the morning, he goes to the Rebbe and he says, Rebbe, I had this scary, frightening dream. Really? Tell me, tell me what the dream was. Rebbe, I had a dream that I was in the next world. My 120 years were up, I was in the next world, and there there was, I came to Shemai, and there was a heavenly tribunal, okay, the, the Bez and Shemai was sitting there judging my life, and the screen comes down, just like that one, looked the same way, and it comes right, straight down, and here it is, this is your life. And from my bar mitzvah on, all of my life was showing, day by day, year by year, going in, in the heavenly time. And all of a sudden, and, and it's beautiful, and the mitzvot, and the shechita that he did, and, and the davening, and the dafyomi, and the shurim, and the learning, and the chesed, everything is great. So the defense attorney who's up there says, hey, look at this, look at Yaakov's life, what a beautiful life. We've got to send them right into Gan Eden, open up those pearly gates, and send them right in. Bezin Shemaila, the heavenly court, says, yeah, it looks like that's the really, Yaakov's a great guy. He's about to open up the gates, he's about to go into Gan Eden, and all of a sudden the prosecutor says, whoa. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You didn't, you didn't put one little screen up there, one little snippet of this man's life. And sure enough, the, the uh, screen starts playing again, the, the video starts playing again, and sure enough, Yankel's walking out of his office Friday afternoon, two hours before Shabbos. And there's a widow who's calling out to Yankel, 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 please help me. I, I have a, you know, I'm a widow. I lost my husband a few months ago and I haven't been able to afford any chicken, any meat for my children. And I just, somebody just gave me a chicken. Could you please chef this chicken for me? So I give my children some, some chicken, some meat before, for Shabbos and they'll finally eat like, like a normal meal, please. And Yankel says, now? It's, it's way too busy. I got, I got two hours to go before Shabbos. I got to order the mikvah. I got to go do that. I got to do, do that. I have no time for you. But Yaakov, please, I'm an old one. I'm a widow. Please help me out. I'm sorry. He just walks away. And Yaakov's crying and his tears are rolling down his, her cheeks as Yaakov very callously walks into oblivion. And the prosecutor says, this is a man you want to send straight to Ganadin? Look at this man. Look what he did to that poor widow. You can't send him straight to Gan Eden. And the Bezin Shemal says, yeah, that's right. You know, he, he's got a very good point. So Yankel, here's the deal. You either 
do it over again. We have to send you back and you have to live your life over again and obviously different circumstances. But you got to make, make it right. Or we got to send you to another place, not called Gan Eden, where you have to just pay the price for your, for your insensitivity. You have 10 seconds to, to respond. You have 10 seconds to answer this question. And the time is ticking down. Five, four, three, two. And Rebbe, that's when I woke up. That's when, in a cold sweat, I realized it was a dream, but it was so real. Rebbe, what, what do I do? He says, you know, it's a pretty scary dream. I got you. So when did that happen? Happened, never happened. Never happened? Anything like it happened? Do you ever show insensitivity to another person? And think about it. It's no, it never happened. So the Rebbe says, if it never happened, then don't bother me. Go back to your regular life. You're a great guy. Dreams happen. And don't worry. It's a, it was a bad dream. Go on with life. The uncle goes on with life. 10, 15, 20 years later, this dream is way, way back in the subconscious background of his mind. And Yankel is a little bit older, 20 years later, he's not the same spring chicken he was before, and he's still going to work, but he's slower and he's slapping along. And sure enough, it's Friday afternoon, in real time, 20 years later. And Yankel walks out of his office two hours before Shabbos, you know, a little bit slower, and all of a sudden, there's an Amona, there's a widow in real time, in real life, with, the, with that same voice that he heard 20 years before, but he forgot his dream. He forgot that reality that he lived in the, the 20 years earlier, and she starts screaming, Yanko, Yanko, I'm so happy to see you. Can you please chef the chicken for me? I have to feed my children. And incredibly, the exact same words Yanko said in his dream, he said in real time, in real life. He said, I have no time for you. You had to have come to me earlier. But Yanko, please, and the tears are rolling down her cheeks, and he walks away, callously into oblivion, leaving the Amara there crying. And Yanko goes home, gets ready for Shabbos, goes to shul, comes back, and his family's around the table, he's holding the coast, and he's making Kiddush, and it hits him. What did I do? And he was so distraught, he fainted. He just dropped to the floor. And his family wakes him up and revives him and says, Yanko, are you okay? Are you okay? He says, quick, get the fish, get the chicken, get, get the soup, get whatever. We got to go to the Almana's house. We have to go to the Almana. We have to give her food. And so the way he writes the story, he's like, what a happy ending that he came to the house. And he asked her for mechila, and she took the food, and sort of, you know, everyone lived happily ever after. But the eerie part of that postscript of that story is that he writes on the bottom in the book, that was the last Shabbos of Yanko's life. He passed away that much of Shabbos, that Saturday night. When I read that story, I had this like really eerie feeling that goes through the back of your neck and down your spine and sort of says like, how could that happen? How could somebody have that dream and then have and relive that dream in real time, in real life with a real mother who's crying to you and you don't respond? And the message to me was, was so profound that if you don't slow things down and recognize the opportunities that are out there for you, you can literally, after 120 years, you never knew what you missed out. You might have some person standing up and saying, wait a minute, not so fast. What about that Friday afternoon? What about this moment in time? What about this incredible opportunity? We're literally dramatic moments. If we go too fast and we're not there to be sensitive to the opportunities like Moshe Bain was, where he recognized what was available to him and he grabbed it, God forbid we could find out 120 years later, what did I, what did I miss? How could I, how could I have been so blind? That's what we're capable of in either direction. Our job is to be like Moshe Beno. Our job is to recognize when those opportunities are there and to sort of say, you know what? It might be a challenge, but if we don't challenge ourselves, how are we ever going to get anywhere? And again, certain times are more dramatic than others, but these present themselves on a regular basis in our lives. So Bez Hashem, we should learn from Moshe Benu to sort of seek out, Vayar Hashem Kisar when Hashem sees that we're that person who's willing to take that step in the right direction and push themselves a little bit more out of their comfort level to do what needs to be done, whether it's for a Jew who's crying out to you, or whether it's just an opportunity to get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, well Bez Hashem, we will make the right decision, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will see that. And just like Moshe Benu was elevated to unique levels, we too will be elevated through our decisions. And in that merit, we to be a Shach Mehem Benu.